Ladies and gentlemen, buenas tardes. On behalf of the Hudson Institute, please be welcome to our discussion this afternoon. Latin America has advanced notably in nurturing former military regimes back into democratic governments. Back at the doors of the 21st century, democracy was prevalent in the hemisphere, while military dictatorships had shrunk into oblivion, or so it was believed. Well, that was then. Today, democracies are still vigorous and prevalent in numbers. However, there remain a few open wounds that each day call for increased attention in the hemisphere. In particular, two countries, Nicaragua and Venezuela, are back to murdering and jailing their citizens. Caracas and Managua have become the killing fields of Latin America, and that's very sad. In Nicaragua, during the last few weeks, about 170 citizens have lost their lives in public demonstrations in Managua and other cities. They seek democracy, real democracy, not the dictatorial hammer of Daniel Ortega. And what can be said about Venezuela? I recently learned that close to a million Venezuelans are now refugees in Colombia. For a small country like Nicaragua, a million, uh, I mean, for, for Venezuela, close to a million now are refugees in the, in the, uh, in Colombia. It's quite a situation. We are very fortunate to have with us three outstanding speakers to discuss with us the maladies of Nicaragua and Venezuela and the reaction of hemispheric organizations to the tragic pic picture of these two countries. The first to speak will be one of the most prominent journalists in Latin America, my distinguished friend at La Nación in San Jose, Armando Gonzalez, who will present the big picture. He will be followed by Humberto Belli, a former minister of education in Nicaragua, and today a beacon of hope in the dark days of his country. Finally, we're fortunate to have with us David Smolansky, a Venezuelan congressman and one of the most dynamic voices in denouncing the criminal behavior of Nicolás Maduro and his regime. After the presentations, I have asked Don Armando to lead an exchange of views among the speakers. And following this, we will open a period of questions and observations from the public. Finally, our thanks to Sean Kelly, Director of Public Activities at Hudson, for his very valuable assistance. He and his staff merit our appreciation. More important, I thank Dr. John Walters, Vice President of Hudson, for his backing and advice. And without any further ado, I turn the, uh, the podium to Don Armando. A little applause, come on. <laughs> <coughs> I deserve it for having walked all the way over here in this climate. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be a short walk and the heat makes it very long. Okay, <laughs> so good morning. Thank you very much and thank you uh, to the Hudson Institute for giving us the opportunity to discuss these matters, which are of the utmost importance, I believe, uh, to all of Latin America uh, and I would say to the Americas. Um, the good news is that there is hope both in Venezuela and Nicaragua. The peoples of those two countries have 
manifested their will to be free by whatever means has been given to them. Not only protests in the streets, but also when they've had an opportunity to go to the ballot box. Of course, the, uh, the results turn out to be somewhat like uh, what Stalin used to say, that um, elections are not won by, are not decided by those who vote, but by those who count the votes. And uh, that's what's been happening in these countries. But it is very obvious that their peoples have decided to return to democracy, and that will not be stopped. So the, new, the good news is that these nightmares will end. The bad news is that we're in the middle of the nightmares. And when it's all done, there are important lessons to be uh, learned from what, from what has happened in both of those countries. Um, basically, it is a lesson about how democratic and republican institutions can be subverted and perverted to uh, legitimize the building or development of, uh, of ways of exercising power towards an autocratic or totalitarian uh, regime. 21st century socialism has been ridiculed for the gap between its pompous name and its vacuity. In effect, there is nothing innovative about squandering Venezuela's riches with no strategy or objective in mind, other than gaining favor with supporters while the money lasts. And there is nothing innovative about squandering Venezuela's riches on the purchase of influence in the world stage. 21st century socialism means nothing as an ideology, as an approach to a complex society's problems, or as a tool to interpret reality. It is, however, innovative in its design of a method to gain power and gradually construct an authoritarian society while maintaining the appearance of rule of law. Daniel Ortega and Hugo Chavez did not descend from the mountains into the presidential palaces. Ortega headed the Sandinista guerrillas, but had to relinquish power to Violeta Chamorro in 1990. He then lost two more elections until he regained power through the ballot box in 2006. Chavez's incursion into violent political takeovers went no farther than his prominent role in the failed coup of 1992 against the constitutionally elected president, Carlos Andres Perez. Six years later, he gained power also through the ballot box and held it until his death in 2013. That, that is 21st century socialism's contribution to, autoc to autocracy. In turn of the century circumstances, the road to power through violence was not feasible and had proven ineffectual once and again. Latin America had seen radicals conquest power through the ballot before, but never a process of consolidation of that power through methodical use and perversion of Republican institutions. In Venezuela, the process enjoyed the support of majorities. The regime quickly equated democracy with elections and behaved as if the electoral victories were a license to redesign political uh, Republican institutions in its favor. The democratic framework guaranteeing dissent and political opposition was gradually replaced with mechanisms designed to put absolute control in the hands of the government and diminish the capabilities of any possible opposition. The press, other political parties, labor unions, and the people in general were gradually subjected to the new rules. The judiciary lost every vestige of independence, and when majorities began to wane, Chavez found ways to bypass the legislative branch with initiatives such as the Ley Habilitante, which surrendered extraordinary powers to the executive after the people stripped it of the qualified majority that had allowed the leader to do his will with the rubber stamp of Congress. Along the way, almost every step could be justified as institutional evolution based on pre-existing laws. Interpretations and legal constructions were often a stretch, but they were sanctioned by a legislator, legislature, 
and ratified by an obedient judiciary. There are important similarities with the Nicaraguan process. Where circumstances required institutional redesign to begin before Ortega gained power through the ballot. He had failed on two prior occasions and would have failed in 2006 if the electoral requirements had not changed. The law required 45% support to declare a winner in an election. Otherwise, there would be a runoff between the two candidates with the most votes. Ortega had fallen short in 1990 when he reached 40,8%, and in 1996 when he got 37,7% of the vote. In 1998, Ortega maneuvered to reform electoral laws to lower the threshold to 40%, or even less if the difference between the first and second place is more than five points. In 2001, he won a bit over 42%, but his opponents were united around Enrique Bolaños, who scored a comfortable victory. So he reached the threshold which he had lowered, but the opposition was united, so he was defeated. In 2006, the field was divided. The 1998 pact which Ortega had made with Arnoldo Aleman, the former president, to lower the threshold paid off, and Ortega won with a 38% plurality against 29% of the vote for his closest contender and 26 for the third place. He would have never met the original 45% threshold requirement and would not have had a chance in a runoff, as evidenced by the fact that two years later, the government, conscious of its minority, staged a fraud as the only means to win the municipal elections. The constitutional amendment of 1998 was made possible by a pact with former president and once arch enemy, Arnoldo Aleman, sentenced to 20 years for corruption and desperate to avoid imprisonment, which he achieved through the deal with Ortega. The former Sandinista guerrilla leader gained power through the ballot box based on a corrupt political pact, but with no possible reproach on legal grounds. Now, it was time to consolidate that power through further institutional redesign. The legislative branch and the judiciary were already in the hands of the coalition formed by the pact. The Electoral Commission had also been co-opted and Sandinista influence over its president, Roberto Rivas, grew in strength with, with each re-election of Rivas thanks to Ortega's backing. Ortega employed his extraordinary powers to forge alliances with sectors of the Catholic Church and the business community. He took control of most of the press through favors and direct acquisitions. Shortly before the 2011 elections, Ortega's allies took judicial action against the constitutional prohibition of re-election to the presidency. Six justices, all of them Sandinistas, voted in absence of the only opposition ma magistrate and nullified the prohibition. Ortega was doubtfully re-elected with over 62% of the votes. Suddenly his support grew immensely and won a great majority in Congress. Enough to finish rewriting the law to establish the possibility of indefinite successive re-elections. He used his over 60% majority to amend the Constitution, establish indefinite re-elections, and declare a victor with any plurality of votes. Those provision, provisions, coupled with his influence over the electoral authority, mean Ortega forever, or so he hopes. In 2016, he was re-elected for the third time with a 72,44% majority in an obviously fraudulent result. With little left to hide, his judiciary stripped the opposition, opposition party of its leader and recognized a different set of officials. Then, Congress heeded an order of the electoral authority to suspend 28 opposition congressmen for not recognizing their new party le leadership. In a single stroke, Ortega dismembered the opposition and took absolute control of Congress. 
These final steps are far removed from any pretense of legality and democratic republicanism. Nicaragua has arrived at the place it was destined by the 21st century socialism roadmap. In Venezuela, destiny was met almost at the same time when Nicolás Maduro lost the National Assembly to the opposition, maneuvered to deny it the supermajority it had won, and eventually replaced it with an illegal constitutional assembly elected through fraudulent means. Both regimes have taken their masks off. The travesty of Republican and Democratic institutions cannot continue in either country with any pretense of legitimacy. The farce is over, as Dante wrote. And two peoples, deserving of a better destiny, are now facing the inferno. Um, the reason I decided to try to put this framework before you is because what is happening at this moment in both Venezuela and Nicaragua uh, is, uh, will be much better um, uh, uh, detailed by the two speakers, uh, both of whom are very active in the politics of their respective countries. So I leave you with Humberto Belli, sociologist, former Minister of Education of Nicaragua. I wonder how many of you know something about the Somoza dictatorship and what reputation it had. Uh, I, I think that it's common agreement. It was a very, a very brutal dictatorship that ran Nicaragua for more than 40 years. And I remember when I was in high school, uh, a long time ago, uh, that there was a famous massacre. The, Nic the Nicaraguan National Guard shoot and kill four students in a demonstration against Somoza. And that became an icon of Nicaraguan uh, youth uh, protests. Uh, 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 it was the 23rd of July, and 20, the 23rd of July became the day of the student, where we commemorated that four students had been killed. And, and we grew up with that uh, idea that Somoza was a uh, savage because they, they had killed four students in an unarmed uh, demonstration. Well, so uh, today, the, uh, the, the, the Ortega regime has already killed over 200 Nicaraguans in two months, 80% 80, 80 of which uh, are students. So just in the first two weeks, he had already killed over 40 students, uh, shooting at unarmed protesters. And to give you an idea, perspective, in Venezuela, after four months of protests, uh, the Maduro regime had killed 150 Venezuelans. In Nicaragua, in two months of protests, the Ortega regime has killed over 200. And Nicaragua is a, a country with six million people. Venezuela is over 30, 20? 30 million. So that, uh, that gives you a perspective of how bloody this repression has been. Uh, I, 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 I never sympathized with Ortega. I, had, I, 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 have always be, I, I, I have been a very outspoken critic of his policies, but I didn't expect it, this type of harsh repression. It, it blew up our expectations. It, it is something beyond uh, our, the worst scenarios that we could predict. So now we are in the midst of a a very bloody conflict that it began almost out of the blue. Uh, you know, I, I am a social scientist, I am a sociologist trained in the U.S., and we pride ourselves on being able to read the signs of the time a little better than the lay people. We want to have some capacity to predict. But when Nicaragua blew up on April 18 this year, we were all taken by surprise. It was such a tremendous expression of anger in the population that we were not expecting. And it all began when the Nicaraguan government changed the, 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 the laws of the Social Security Institute, uh, taxing the, people, uh, the elderly people with 5% of their, of their income in behalf of the, 
or the finances of the institute. A student began to protest. The protests were crushed with, with, uh, uh, with uh, government mobs. And, and uh, two students were killed, and then the, the country exploded. And now the country is already a, 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 a numbers of Nicaraguans are on the streets, uh, claiming not only for a smaller change in, in policy, but for uh, the complete overthrow of the, of the, Sunday, of the Ortega regime. Uh, uh, in my life, in which I have, I have participated in many demonstrations, I had never seen the caliber the huge numbers that have been on the streets of Nicaragua protesting the government. We had recently a demonstration in Managua, which, is a, which has a population of 1.3 million, in which half to half million people participated. Uh, estimates are difficult to make, but uh, 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 conservative estimates put the numbers in 300,000, the other estimates in 500,000. But if you were to have a, uh, a, an equivalent demonstration of this size, let's say in New York, it would take about three million people marching in New York City against the government. So what I want to convey is that they had, uh, we are witnessing a tremendous upheaval in which massive amounts of people, especially, especially young people, are demonstrating against the government, taking to the streets, building barricades, and the, the government has been responding in a very brutal, brutal way uh, every uh, the, uh, the death count now uh, today is about five people are being killed every day. So the seven people were killed yesterday, five people before yesterday. I don't know how many are going to be killed. By the time I come back to my country, there will be 10, 25 more people dead. And uh, uh, some, sometimes uh, uh, we, uh, we ask ourselves why this amount of killing because as allegedly, uh, the, the government is killing people to uh, break up the barricades which, which are being built in, in, in almost every city in Nicaragua right, right now. But uh, there is another theory, another hypothesis, which is that the government is killing people in a brutal way. Uh, and by the way, most of the killings have been, um, be, uh, have been performed by snipers. Uh, uh, in the, in, 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 on, the, um, on the 30th of May, there was a massive uh, May Day, uh, day of uh, Mother Day's demonstration. In Nicaragua, we celebrate Mother's Day on May 30th. At the end of the march, in which I participated, we participated, 18 young people were killed. All, there were almost no wounded. Uh, nine out of 10 had been shot in the head. The government had been using snipers uh, as a systematic way to break up uh, the protests, but I think that one of the, of the reasons why they keep killing in a way that could be ineffectual because the barricades are still there and growing is that they are possibly trying to anger people so that the opposition react in anger. They burn some buildings, sometimes they kill some policemen, which in fact have been, had happened, and so the government claim, uh, can claim that they are not facing a pacific resistance that they are facing uh, uh, a, a wild mobs that need to be curbed, uh, that are destroying the economy of the country. If you listen to the government broadcast, how they present themselves on TV and how their re representatives uh, portray themselves, they claim to be uh, those who are fighting for peace. The government is, is blameless. Uh, Pre Vice President Murillo recently said that the government is not responsible for any death caused since April 18. No one death. It is all made up by the opposition. And she also claimed that in Nicaragua there are not, uh, how do you say, paramilitares, paramil paramilitaries. paramilitaries, gangs on the streets. Uh, you, you can pass this uh, newspaper of a few days ago uh, that I brought from, from Nicaragua, but it, it, it shows photographs of paramilitary groups riding on, uh, on, uh, on these uh, vehicles uh, with brandishing AK-47s. Um, we have tons of videos. I have them with my, my cell phone, a lot of videos where you can see snipers in civilian, in civilian clothing going along with the police uh, uh, with telescopic uh, 
eh, eh, mira telescópica, uh, eh, eh, ready to shoot people. And I think that uh, this is, a, this is a, a well planned, devilish strategy in which they want to anger people so that people take revenge and they can claim that they are victimized by the opposition, that the opposition is wild, is a murderer. Uh, uh, and, and I think that the, the, the hidden purpose is that they might justify eventually the intervention of the army, that the army uh, has no way, has, uh, is obliged to crush the, the protest because uh, the protesters are uh, burning the country, are destroying the economy, et cetera. Uh, since since, since, since uh, right now we are in the midst of this uh, situation and, that, and uh, at the same time the bishops, uh, the Nicaraguan bishop called for a dialogue. The government has been meeting with, uh, representatives of the government have been meeting with uh, mem members of the opposition and the dialogue is uncertain and we don't know whether Ortega is going to accept to call for earlier elections, which would be a way out of the, of the, of the conflict, or step out of, of government. So far, he hasn't given us a clue as to, whether, uh, as to what his purposes are. And uh, we feel a little pessimistic because although they speak peace and they, they in a way that uh, exceeds the, the holiness of St. Francis of Assisi, so they claim themselves to be instrument of, of, the, of the Lord peace. And they, they, they use this word of uh, love con continuously, uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, and at the same time, they are killing five people every day. Uh, and so we, we, are, we are puzzled. We are, in, a, we are, we are in, a, in the worst type of crisis that we have ever seen in many decades. And sometimes we feel depressed and desperate because we don't know if we are going to see the light. Uh, we have two hopes right now. I do. I have uh, two hopes. Uh, one is that the army, which has been restrained, uh, 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 which is a good point, the army has uh, publicly declared that they don't want to uh, get out to the streets you know, on the street to repress civilians. Uh, that, that's a good message. But they are. But they are allowing at the same time that paramilitary groups armed with AK-47s are around the, uh, the streets killing indiscriminately. So one hope is that the army eventually will, pu will press Ortega to make real changes or, or, or will act in a, in, a, in a stronger way. And the other hope is that we get some help from the international community. In this type of dramas, how the international community reacts is key for the outcome of our pro for the for how our problems get solved or get uh, 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 for instance, the Nicaraguan, uh, the, the Nicaraguan army has many investments in the U.S. Uh, uh, ma many of, the, of, those, uh, the, of the high officers of the Nicaraguan army are uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the savings of the army for health purposes and for, uh, for the right there is are kept in the U.S. banks. So the U.S. could have a lot of leverage into pressuring the army to behave Otherwise, they could be sanctioned. And, and I think that if we were to have a strong solidarity from an uh, organization of American states, uh, US, the European community, that could force Ortega to give free elections, as he did in 1990, after the Civil War, in which international pressures forced him to grant an election that he lost. So yeah, we're hoping that repeats itself today and that Nicaragua is not left alone. The more solidarity we can elicit from friends uh, 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 in, in, in here and in other countries, uh, the, the greater our hopes that this bloody conflict will end. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Starting in the 1980s, uh, Venezuela began a process of political reform which gave greater autonomy under democratic governments to uh, the mayors, uh, municipalities. And that has become a headache for the current uh, autocratic government because many important leaders of the opposition have stemmed from, have come from uh, uh, those uh, municipalities. David Smolansky is one of the cases. He is the mayor of El Atillo, 
in exile. Um, he is also a journalist and a um, constant participant in uh, his country's opposition from exile. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to this important uh, conference. At, at the, uh, thank you, Hudson Institute, for the invitation. And it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Mr. Umberto, who was a former uh, minister in Nicaragua. Uh, I prepared some uh, videos and pictures that are unfortunately for technically uh, difficulties is not possible to, to share with you, but I'll try my best with my iPad. <laughs> so um, um, just very quickly to see those pictures. I don't know if you are able to see them. There are many pictures. These are very hard. The thing that I wanted to show with these pictures is that you cannot recognize if it's Venezuela or Nicaragua. The repression is the same. As uh, Mr. Humberto said, uh, last year in Venezuela, 157 people were killed by the regime on the protest, 120 days. I was part of those nonviolent protests that were asking for free elections, that were asking for uh, the release of the political prisoners, and we were asking also for uh, humanitarian aid because people literally are dying every day because of shortages of food and, and medicine. And the regime didn't do anything about it. They uh, didn't accept to have a free elections. They didn't release political prisoners. And they didn't uh, accept any help from the international community with food and medicine. They repressed the protest. They uh, detained thousands of, 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 of Venezuelans that were on the streets, especially young uh, students, and they decided to kill us. And they killed 157 uh, Venezuelans. And six mayors, including um, I am one of them, were removed from office. And, um, and um, we are under arrest warrant because we didn't uh, repress the protests on our municipalities because it is our right to, to be on the streets, and especially with this uh, nonviolent. So it is a shame that a year after we're, we're, we're witnessing the same in Nicaragua, and, in, and with the same uh, methodology. I mean, you have security forces, uh, especially police, and you have the paramilitary groups repressing the people. And one of the things that is really complicated to explain, and, and it is so annoying when you are protesting, I, I was on the streets 120 days last year, is when you see those paramilitary, param, paramilitary groups protected by the security forces. Because they are protected by the security forces, and the innocent people are completely unprotected. You cannot do anything about it. And they just go and attack you. And when I say they attack you, you get hurt, or you can be, you can be killed. Or also, uh, I've seen that in, in Nicaragua, and, and happened last year in, in Venezuela. At night, those paramilitary groups attacked houses very late at night. So there, were, there was always uh, something that the opposition was criticized in the past, that the people that live in the popular area, or that live in rural area or slums in Venezuela support the Chavez. That changed completely. Now, eight out of 10 Venezuelans want, want, want democracy, basically. Don't, doesn't want to have, doesn't want Maduro in power. On those slums, the protests were at night. And, uh, and the regime didn't have couldn't control them because it was something very spontaneous. So what the regime decided to do is to attack them uh, at night. Uh, so many houses were lost, many people were hoard, and many others were uh, uh, detained. So I, I have to congratulate Hudson, Hudson Institute for that great picture, Maduro and Ortega, because the picture is not Maduro and Ortega. The picture is the flag which is behind Maduro, which is Cuba. 
Cuba is behind all of this. I mean, this is not something that is all, only designed by uh, the Nicaragua regime or by the Venezuelan regime. Diaz-Canel with Raul Castro are the ones who are behind all this uh, repression because the socialism of the 21st century that had its background in, um, in the photo of Sao Paulo, it is not a project for one country. It's not a project for Venezuela. It's not a project for Nicaragua. It is a regional uh, uh, project. And um, even though Maduro uh, is, is, is not a, is, it doesn't have the approval as he wants to have, or Ortega uh, doesn't have the approval that he wants to have, they use arms and they use these paramilitary groups to maintain power. And this takes me to the another topic that I wanted to share with you, the modern dictatorships. We need to understand the modern dictatorships. The old school dictatorships, especially in Latin America, were the ones that went through the coup d'etat, were the ones that, through violence, you see the general took the power, went to the palace, and the dictatorship started. These guys changed completely the way the dictatorships starts. They use democratic ways to conquer power, and from power, destroy those democratic institutions. So you see 1998 Venezuela. Hugo Chavez was elected president of my country. He was elected with free media. He was elected in a free and fair elections. He was elected with, uh, with uh, finance uh, from, the, from the government to the political parties. He was elected between many candidates, and he was elected with um, legalized political parties. May 20, 20 uh, 2018, 20 years after Chavez was elected, what was the election that we had in Venezuela? First of all, that was not election at all. That was a fraud. So we didn't have the candidates from the opposition that were able to compete. The candidates that, uh, that really could go and, and compete in the election and win and be president, such as Leopoldo Lopez, he's in jail, such as Antonio Ledesma, he's in exile, so, and, and, and many others who cannot run uh, to be president. But furthermore, the, the, the majority of opposition political parties in Venezuela, such as the one I'm a part of, Voluntad Popular, or Primero Justicia, are illegalized. Third, there's no free media at all in Venezuela. We just use Twitter or Facebook to, to, to communicate ourselves. Fourth, there is an illegal institution that was created by Maduro last year during the protest, the National Constituency, which is the parallel of the, of, of the parliament that was won by the majority of the opposition uh, three years uh, ago. And the Electoral Council is controlled by Maduro. So when you see that, and, when, and, and, and Maduro chose the, 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 the opposition candidate that he wanted to, to face, something very similar that happened in, 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 in Nicaragua. So when, when, when you see this, we, you, we need to understand that modern dictatorships use democratic ways to conquer power and from power destroy those democratic institutions. And I'm putting those two examples in Latin America. I will, I will not talk more about other regions. Because we, have, we, are part, we are part of a region, we are a geopolitical uh, context that, for example, the Russian Federation is playing really hard in, in Venezuela. And you can see what, how was the election on March in uh, Russia. So um, that's for the, democrat, the, demo, the, the, demo, the, the, the people that we believe in democracy, we need to understand that democracy is not only elections. Democracy is more than elections. Is to have a guarantee of our human rights, is a guarantee of our civil rights, is a guarantee of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, is a respect of uh, my minorities, is to have solid institutions, is to have alternacy in, 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 in power. And maybe these things that I'm saying could sound really basic, but when you see that 40% of the world population are living under authoritarian regimes, something's happening with democracy. And as technology innovates, as education innovates, or the medicine innovates, also authoritarian regimes innovate. And Chavez understood that, Ortega understood that, and Maduro is trying to uh, understand that. So in Venezuela, what can I tell you about last year? Thousands of people were detained, thousands of people were wounded, uh, mayors were removed, more than 100. Uh, now, right, right now, there are more, more than 300 uh, political uh, prisoners. And Maduro, even though is having a, a disapproval of 80% of the population. Well, he's using armed forces and, and parliamentary groups to maintain power, as 
the same as uh, Nicaragua. So one of the things that I also want to share with you in this conference is as the dictators work together to maintain power, the ones that we live in democracy also need to work together to, re to, re to restore democracy. So the ones that are protesting in Nicaragua, well, the, the ones that we the protested in Venezuela, we need to support them. And also the Nicaragua need to, pro to support the ones in Venezuela. I, I, three weeks ago, I went to a protest that, that uh, was done by the, the Nicaraguan uh, people here in Washington, D.C., in the OAS. And, uh, and, and it was courageous when we came in, and, and it was so uh, very hopeful that because I feel I felt so in the fight. It's, it's the same, it's the same problem that we are that we are that we are facing. So, um, as I said, I mean, as dictators helps themselves, but well, democratic people need to help themselves. Just to finish, I mean, the thing, the situation in Venezuela, we were maybe a year after. <laughs> I mean, what Nicaragua is living now is what we had last year. Um, in Venezuela, as I said, it was a fraud on May 20th. Um, and we need to work on three strategies. I mean, and that's what I'm trying to work in exile. First of all, uh, we need to um, we need to to recover, or we need we need to go to the streets again. Nonviolent protest. It's been difficult to have it again because people, I will not lie to you, are I mean, they are afraid that they could be killed after what happened uh, last year. Uh, but we need to to have those protests uh, again. In Venezuela, there are 25 daily protests, but no political protests. There are protests because of lack of food, lack of medicine, crime, lack of gas, lack of electricity. So those protests need to be led or need to be at least, um, uh, com um, people need to be with closer to, the, the political leaders need to be closer to those protests. Second, the, the, the effort on the international community. The, 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 I think, um, the, it is a key strategy for us that the, all the effort from the international community needs to be done on a multilateral uh, effort. I mean, not only on, on one country, one region. That's why all the effort that we have done, it's, it's, it's in Latin America, North America, and the European Union. So 14 countries from Latin America call their ambassadors after the fraud, fraud in May 20. More sanction has come from the US government and probably in the next weeks, more sanctions from the European Union will come against high officials who have been uh, involved in, uh, in, in crimes such as violation of human rights, money laundry, and, and, um, and corruption, and drug, and drug trafficking. Uh, we're talking about uh, Alunasa, a uh, company in Costa Rica, and, and, it's, and has a run in all Central America, if I'm not, if I'm not right, if I'm not wrong, that Diosdado Cabello that was sanctioned just before May 20th, which is, in my opinion, the, the, the guy that is the, the one that maintains the, the regime, oh, he, he is, I mean, he's, he has all the money laundry through that uh, company. <coughs> so those are the efforts that has to be done. And third, and not least, uh, that is something that is interesting of what's going on in Nicaragua, the armed forces in Venezuela. I mean, remember that Chavez was a soldier. And because he was a soldier, uh, he gave so many privileges to the armed forces. Uh, it's like the comparison that now is between Chavez and Lopez Obrador in Mexico. We'll see what happens in Mexico in a few weeks, but at least there is a difference. AMLO is not, uh, is not a soldier. Chavez was a soldier, and as I said before, he found democratic ways to conquer power. But, the, the, but first, he tried to coup d'etat to conquer power. That's why I, I never liked him. So. Um, Venezuela has 2,000 generals. That's more than the whole NATO. 2,000 generals, that's more than the whole NATO. They don't only have military powers, but they have also economic and political uh, privileges. But having said that, the majority of the armed forces are officials from the middle and low range, that they're suffering the same problems as any in Venezuela. I mean, they suffer from crime. In the last three years, there is an average of 300, uh, 300 um, officials that have been killed because of crime. They suffer from lack of food, they suffer from lack of medicine, and just in the last uh, year, there have been four military movement in Venezuela that the regime has been able to, to dismantle. So um, when I say this is that we need the middle and low range officials from the armed forces in Venezuela to become institutional, 
to do and obey what the Constitution says, that is to protect our territory and protect uh, Venezuelans. If they do that, if they are able to do that, because I, I know there are many soldiers right now in Venezuela which disagree with Maduro, well, the regime, in my opinion, will be done, because that's the main pillar right now for Maduro, and they have to be an agreement that they need to go back to the barracks, because the ones that need to govern Venezuela are the civilians, as it happened uh, 60 years ago in, in Venezuela when we, ha when we started uh, democracy. So hope what I said is uh, useful for, for you. And once again, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. <laughs> Um, David touched on a topic that has to do with Costa Rica, my country. Uh, we, um, Alunasa is a, Venezuela was a great producer of aluminum uh, and it bought a company in Costa Rica to um, manufacture aluminum products and di distribute them throughout Central America. Well, it turns out that my newspaper published on Friday that that company has been used by Diosdado Cabello, the number two man in Venezuela's uh, regime, uh, to launder money. And this is an important aspect to take into consideration because it is also a similarity, a similarity between the two countries. Uh, in their first run in power, uh, the Sandinistas uh, were um, investigated for drug trafficking, and there is currently a movie uh, about Barry Seal, the pilot, uh, uh, showing, uh, which actually portrays some of what was happening uh, in Managua uh, back then. So uh, this whole delinquency is also um, um, a factor in these governments, uh, and currently more in the Venezuelan government. Is that not so? Um, this question might sound premature because both countries are in a deep crisis at this moment, but I want to ask you both, what comes next? Uh, because opposition forces in both countries have been divided and decimated uh, uh, throughout, uh, through these years. And uh, what sort of a solution could the op an opposition articulate uh, when these regimes uh, are overthrown, which I am sure they will be. Well, the, the Nicaraguan opposition is uh, very strong. Uh, 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 we have no formal parties opposing the regime because they have been decimated, but the degree of uh, street opposition, the, by the degree of, of uh, uh, popular participation in the civic resistance is amazing. It's also a very, in fact, it is very moving. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, very, such a high percentage of young people have taken to the streets, are taken to the streets right now. They are occupying, they are building barricades, hundreds of barricades in, 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 the, in, the, whole, in the country, in spite of the fact that they are being shot. But, uh, but um, uh, uh, they, they have been very sp uh, uh, spontaneous. They, they, they didn't rise up because there was any call to arms or call to resistance coming from leaders. They just call themselves through the cell phones and through the, these uh, informal uh, networks. And, and so they came to the streets, and th that's the way they have been acting so far. But isn't, but that, a, Humberto, isn't that a reason to worry about the future? Yeah, it is, it is a, uh, there is a worry right now because uh, what we might call the opposition is, uh, we could say, is divided in the, in the sense that some groups, especially the business leaders, members of the church and some other more formal members of formal organizations want Ortega to grant free elections, anticipated free elections. Elections are planned for 1921. Um, a, a group of us want those elections to be uh, performed next year as soon as possible with due warranties that we are going to have international supervision change in the electoral laws, et cetera. But there are many others, especially young people and some peasants on the streets who want Ortega to get out uh, now. Uh, and, and they don't want to negotiate with, with the Ortega regime. They want him out. And they say, they, we, are not, we are not going to dismantle our barricades unless he moves, he goes. So uh, we have this type of problem, which has been, uh, hasn't been solved. Um, 
it is important to get a, to get to know. David, the opposition in Venezuela can it offer at this moment uh, an alternative once uh, the government comes down? Yes, as I, as I said uh, in my presentation, uh, first we need to get um, we need to change the system in Venezuela right now. I mean, it's not only about Maduro. It's just an authoritarian the region has been in power for, for 20 years. That's why I said it's very important to come back to the streets, to be with the people that are protesting right now in Venezuela because of social and economical problems, to continue the effort from the international community to isolate the regime and weaken them, and also well, the institutional behavior that needs to be done by the armed forces to, to restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela. We have uh, very good uh, initiatives on how we can uh, rebuild our country on the, economic, uh, on the economic area, on the energy sector, which is really important. Venezuela used to produce 10 years ago uh, 3 million uh, barrels. Now it's producing 1.3 uh, million barrels, which is something that I'm really concerned, not because the decrease of the producing, because of the, I, I think Maduro will, and is now doing that, will transit to a uh, uh, criminal economy to try to sustain, to try to maintain the regime. And then when that moment becomes formal, that could be very soon, that's also that maybe the, he will be done because the international community, I mean, doesn't, will, will not accept that, you know? And, and in, my, in my case, I'm in exile here in Washington, and I'm, and I'm doing a, a research as a visiting scholar in Georgetown. I mean, there's good initiatives about our security. I mean, Venezuela is now the least safe country to live, according to the Gallup Group that made a, the last report uh, last, year, last um, uh, week. So we are, we are, we are ready to rebuild um, our country. But before to rebuild it, that's, that's what I dream of. And as I want to go back as soon as possible to my country, we need to change uh, the system that, as I said before, is using arms to and, 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 and is killing people, innocent people, detaining innocent people to maintain power. You mentioned the army. The, um, the army was said to have refused to uh, cooperate with a fraud uh, in 2016, when, 15. 15, when December 2015, when the assembly was elected. It is said that the army um, uh, said, no, we, we will not participate in a fraud. Uh, they were afraid of doing so. Uh, also, there was a recording circulated of a group of army uh, uh, members of uh, high office, high-ranking officers, uh, who were doubting whether to intervene in repression because of consequences, um, international uh, uh, judicial consequences, such as in the human rights uh, courts and so on. Um, uh, so. How likely is the army to uh, step back and to let this play out in the streets with the paramilitary and the police doing the repression? Well, if I knew that, I would be now playing a casino to be a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> and also, if I know that, I wouldn't say that publicly. <laughs> so um, um, there are, I just can say that, that there are a lot of um, disagreement in the armed forces with the regime. Uh, the main challenge that they're facing right now is how they articulate. I mean, we, are, we have four, four components. I don't know if that's the right word in English. You have, a, a VA, you have a, a bran four branches, thank you. You have a, uh, the Marines, you have the, the, um, the uh, air, air Forces, uh, El Ejército, sorry. The Army, Army and, the, and the National Guard. So there are disagreements in all of them. The ones that have been used to repress, hardly it's uh, the National Guard. But they are, they are disagreement. But the thing for them is how they are articulated. And I have to say, I mean, the, the Cubans, I mean, they, they, are, they are inside our armed forces. That's the main problem. I mean, we have the Cubans working on the armed forces. We have the Cubans uh, working on the, in the intelligence uh, agents also. So f they are afraid. They are, they are, right now, they are. 150 soldiers who are in jail in Venezuela. There are more soldiers in jail in Venezuela than political prisoners. And they have been uh, tortured. I mean, they, uh, there are some of them, we don't even know in which jail they are. And that's why 
and, and that's how it's happening because there are disagreements on inside the, the regime. And Humberto, how likely is the army in Nicaragua to stick to what they have publicly said, which is that they will not intervene? Uh, and is there Cuban influence no. in the army? No, uh, no, we, we don't. We don't see any any yet. There may be, but we haven't seen it. And the Nicaraguan army went through a, prof a process of prof prof professionalization since 1990 when Mr. Chamorro came to power. So uh, we now have an army which is very able, uh, relatively uh, a political, is not siding openly with or with the Ortega regime. And what I said before, the fact that they have many investments in the U.S., the fact that they they are they they see that Nicaragua is sinking into a, 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 an economic hole. Uh, they uh, our uh, the business community is in anguish right now, and they are part of the business community. So the army has to think which way they go. If they stay to if they stick to Ortega and they come up go out to defend Ortega, they may be burning their chances. To be respected in the future, and even they might be risking their own uh, p political existence. Uh, uh, I, and and I, I see many reasons why they might have interests, even self-interest, in forcing Ortega to step down. Because if that doesn't happen, uh, you know, Nicaragua is a, more, more, a much more fragile country than Venezuela. Our economy cannot sustain itself more than four months if this situation continues. The bank are uh, see, uh, seeing their deposit to flee. I think that three, four more, more months of this situation is going to sink the country, is going to bankrupt the, the financial se sector. Uh, already the, the, uh, the, the, the number of uh, unemployed are skyrocketing. We predict that uh, by the end of the year, uh, if we project the, the current uh, uh, Death statistics and economic data, by the end of the year, the Nicaraguan econ economy will have sunk from 4% that was going to, uh, that was predicted by, at the beginning of the year to minus 4%. Mm -hmm. And the number of unemployed will, will, will go up from 20,000, 40,000 right now to 300,000. And so it, this is going to hurt the, uh, all Nicaraguan and, 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 and the army. So we do have hopes that the army might react. In a, might, might react. Uh, uh, we have we have already seen that so many uh, so, uh, some policemen have abandoned their uniforms, are so deserting. Uh, if this process uh, uh, increases, then Or uh, Ortega is doomed. But but, but still we uh, he still have uh, money reserves. He can uh, he he can uh, uh, he can resist more than the private sector can. And so I have many friends who businesses are uh, uh, in the verge of collapsing. Uh, uh, half of my friends, I would say, have lost their businesses already. And in three more months, I don't know how they are going to be, uh, but, uh, but Ortega can still have, uh, 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 can they still use the Nicaraguan money reserves? Although, the, uh, although by, but, uh, by, by December, he will, uh, he, will, he will be really against a corner. Venezuela at least has to pay oil, not much, but at least <laughs> not anymore. Why not, why not enough to pay the the, 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 the pocket money of, of the of the gangsters that are running the country, but we don't have that in Nicaragua. So, I would now like to invite you to ask your questions. Yes. Good afternoon, Alex Sanchez, I'm an analyst here in DC. One question for the minister. Uh, you talked a lot about Ortega, but can you talk more about um, the First Lady, Rosario Murillo, who's now the Vice President too. Uh, I've met a, a number of, of Nicaraguans who are very anti-the government, and they, just they talk about the Ortega-Murillo government, the regime, the Ortega-Murillo regime. It's not just Ortega anymore. What's, what has uh, the First Lady Murillo's role been in this so far, and what do you expect from her in the future? Thank you. Yeah, uh, she's the one who has been running the day-to-day -day operations of the government. Ortega has been a, a, a more remote figure, and uh, she goes out on the radio every day to preach the gospel and uh, to speak about love and peace. And 
uh, and she uh, appa apparently she's the one more opposed to negotiations in order to shorten Ortega's period. But, she, uh, but at the same time, she's uh, hated in many circles of the Sandinista uh, uh, party. She's not very popular among the Sandinistas, as she's very unpopular among the people. That is why those symbols of her power, which are those type of, uh, uh, you have, uh, you, I don't know, you have seen them, these type of trees. She, she planted metal, huge metal trees, 160 of them in, in, the, in the Nicaraguan streets. Uh, they have some type of uh, symbolism. Uh, she, she's, uh, we, call her, we call her sometimes the witch. She, she, she's, very, she's very strange. She has about uh, 20 rings in, in, her, in every hand, a lot of uh, amulets, and she's very uh, weird. <laughs> uh, and, and, and when the, the young, young people took to the streets, they, they saw those uh, big trees as, as the symbol of her magic and her power. And they began destroying them and, and toppling them. And you could see uh, in the video the joy of uh, young people leaping, uh, leaping with joy uh, because uh, they, they saw the, this part of Murillo being challenged. Uh, but but I, I don't think she's, a, uh, although she has a lot of power, uh, her power does, uh, she's not very liked uh, within the army, uh, uh, even if it's the Sandinista party itself. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think that she can play a major role in prolonging the life of the government. Sure. May I ask you two questions about Venezuela? One is, I think that at the uh, recent G7 meeting, the Europeans committed $40 billion to support uh, Venezuela. I'm wondering what, whether you think that that is good or bad uh, in the context that in the past the government has refused all kinds of uh, external donations. The second question about uh, Venezuela is, what is the status of the ALBA arrangements? Is, um, is uh, Venezuela supplying the oil to the Caribbean countries, and are they paying and is that uh, a good thing? Well, first from the second question, if they are paying, <laughs> difficult to know, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, we are producing, as I said before, uh, 1.4 uh, million uh, barrels, uh, which is uh, at, at almost 50% of those uh, barrels are compromised. I mean, through PetroCaribe, in, in with the Caribbean countries, or paying the debt with China, a 25 billion debt that we have with China that probably my grandchildren will still pay in that. Um, yeah, and yeah, of course, with Cuba, we have that, that uh, preference agreement that we still uh, sell, <coughs> give them all barrels. I think right now it's close to 100,000 barrels, and uh, they, they send doctors, teachers, which is no other thing that, uh, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, um, agent, uh, intelligence officers and, and so on. And with the G7, um, which was really important what these uh, seven countries did uh, on the summit, um, the 25 million euro that the European Union uh, agreed to give to Venezuela was not to, it was to help the Venezuelan refugees. Uh, so they are helping the governments, such as Colombia or Brazil, and there are others in the region that they are having uh, Venezuelans who are in a refugee situation. It's not the first help that, that the uh, Venezuelan refugees uh, receive. Also, there is uh, almost uh, 20 million that were received through USAID and the government of Norway. So uh, the, the international community also is looking like, well, we have, we have, I mean, I have been told in, in, in meetings, I, I was in the Lima summit, and we had an opportunity to talk to uh, different uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We were able even to talk to Vice President Pence. All of them told us that they are uh, committed to give billions to Venezuelans who are still in Venezuela for, for medicine and food. But because Maduro refused to that aid, well, they are trying at least to help the ones who are in refugee situation. I'm sorry to take a bit longer to this answer. I mean, there are three million Venezuelans who have left the country, three million. Um, there is not an exact 
ex ex we don't know exactly how many are on a refugee situation. But it's at least five percent of those people are in refugee situation. We have 150,000 people who are very refugee. I was in the border two months ago, and what I saw there, uh, I cannot put it in words. I mean, 45,000 Venezuelans are crossing the border with Colombia every single day. 3,000 uh, do not come back to 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 Venezuela. So the international community is trying to to help those one who were sleeping literally on the on the on the streets on in, in, in Colombia, in Brazil, and even in Mexico or Argentina, who are far away from us. There is one way that the especially the Caribbean community countries are paying back. Uh, the reason the Organization of American States has not been able to apply the Democratic Charter to Venezuela is because of the majority formed by uh, all of the island members, which are many, uh, which benefit from uh, uh, Venezuela's uh, or Maduro's generosity with Venezuela's wealth. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility that Nicaragua and Venezuela will be the medicine to the rest of Latin America saying the socialist route doesn't work? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think so. If people have capacity to learn, which sometimes they don't, they will see, they will see the clear outcome of the socialism of the 21st century. So the, the, these regimes are morally bankrupt. They have no ideological appeal anymore. So they, they are just surviving by the sheer fact of that they have force. They have no ideology, romanticism around them. And I, and I hope this, uh, uh, I hope we, the young, younger generations are going to learn the lesson. I hope so. Just to add to the, the minister, Mr. Humberto, um, I have a strong disagreement with the generation of my parents and grandparents in Venezuela because they used to say that Venezuela was great because of oil and the beauty that represents us in the Miss Universe. And we, didn't, and we didn't say the most important thing. Venezuela was the country that exported democracy when Latin America didn't have democracy. When the world, the, mm -hmm. the, the world, when, the world when Central America had uh, its conflict with the war, when Colombia had its, its armed conflict, when you saw the dictatorships in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, the dictatorship in Cuba, uh, my father is from Cuba, when he fled Cuba, he went to Venezuela, Dominican Republic, I mean, when all those problems were going on in Latin America, Venezuela had solid institutions, had different presidents, had uh, freedom, had democracy, and I think we were not, um, the generation of my parents and my grandparents were not able to export that to the region. And now, well, you have Chavez and then Maduro. Uh, but what I've seen in the region is that, maybe, maybe I don't know if I'm wrong, but I, I think that, uh, that in the region has been an important advance on, on democracy. I think the main challenge that the region has, apart from Nicaragua, Venezuela, and, 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 and Cuba, is corruption. That's the main challenge that Latin America has right now. I mean, to build more transparent uh, governments. And if we are able to achieve that, we're going to advance a lot in, in, in democracy. But uh, for sure, we need, to get, we need to change the system as soon as possible in Nicaragua and Venezuela, because that's a project that wants to be expanded in the region. And speaking of lessons to be learned, uh, we must stress the, uh, the lesson of how Republican and Democratic institutions can be subverted, even through the ballot box, uh, to, be, to, to institutionalize autocracy. And it's not only on socialism side, because in other regions of the world, it's happening on the right also. Uh, so uh, I think that's really something we have to keep an eye out for. Hi, I think. Um, I have a question for Venezuela Nica. Um, do you think education is a reason of the both country situation? The lack of education. Sorry, I missed the word. It's hard to answer. Yeah. Because we have seen 
highly educated countries going the wrong way. Uh, well, the classical example of the last century was uh, uh, Germany. Um, uh, but I, I really, I, I, I I, I really don't know because uh, Venezuela had the reputation of having a very, uh, a very strong uh, democratic, uh, 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 democratic education in the sense that democracy was highly prized and uh, there were institutes uh, teaching young people about the values of democracy and yet you got what you got. And public education. Uh, so maybe values? I thought yeah, well, yeah, yeah, more, it's, yeah, it could be more a case of values. In the case of Venezuela, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. I don't think Chavez was a result of lack of education. Um, I think that um, that um, just it was um, many people that had the opportunity to be involved in the public administration and politics decided to not go there. Things were great and just be wealthy and the politics and, and, and the public administration is for other people. In my opinion, that was the real problem in Venezuela. And you see the political parties in Venezuela in the 1990s, I mean, um, they were not, they didn't, they didn't give opportunity to young people to, you know, to emerge. And uh, we had a lot of lack of leadership and then came uh, Charles. But I don't think lack of education was the reason of the dictatorship that we have in Venezuela. What we have right now is a lack of knowledge, which is, one of the main challenges that we're going to have when we're going to rebuild the country. You had a question, madam. Yes, my name is Mia. I, I just don't hear the, what people really say or what they really think and what's really happening. Like in America, you may call this a democracy, but I don't call this a democracy because people really don't have a choice. The, the voting is really manipulated by a few people who are really what I call bad guys, they miss it's a term. So I just wonder, in, in history, in, in the emperor history, there are some good emperor, although they are coming from the poor poverty. Sometimes they can turn out to be very good king and the whole dynasty is very good. And so I just don't know whether there's misleading or some kind of suppression or cover up. Ah, they say America is good, and Venezuela or Nicaragua are bad. It's just what people say about what they are feeling and whether their vote is true or there's really, like they have knowledge about who is a good politician, who is going to be elected, or they are really manipulated. So I don't know if it's a good democracy or good socialism is, is, can be bad as, as bad as America. America is totally a disaster. And you can see it's a free influence. This capitalism is a failure. America is a radio. They just don't allow you to speak. Thank I'm you. glad I have a chance to speak now, but I just want to hear the real voice Thank of you. people and how do they suffer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, voting... Voting is not all there is. That's what we've been talking about. You also have to have uh, other institutions that guarantee civil liberties and respect uh, for human rights. And, uh, and, and those conditions, unfortunately, are not present either in Nicaragua and Venezuela. Uh, but uh, voting is very important and necessary. So if you want to have a, a democracy, uh, and that's precisely what we've been discussing, uh, the need to respect um, those Republican institutions, uh, uh, which, um, by the way, are, have had an enormous impulse uh, beginning with uh, the constitutional framework of the United States and the ideals that its founding fathers uh, uh, put forth, fortunately, I would say. But, I, but I, I wanted to get back to what you asked about the role of education, uh, which link, uh, is related to the lack of appreciation for democratic values. I think that one of the problems that we had in Nicaragua and enabled Ortega to be as powerful as he came 
was the collaboration of the private sector. Uh, he offered the private community to prosper. Uh, he offered them a, a stability, um, a business a, a protection for businesses, as long as the business community would not demand from him democratic changes or democratic reforms. And the Nicaraguan community, business community was pleased. They were making money, so they had accepted that status quo. And uh, now they found themselves that the, uh, having a, a neglecting democratic institution was fatal, even for their own businesses. So that's something that has to be teach, uh, taught and, um, and learned that democracy is not uh, 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 something cosmetic that you can afford not to have. It is essential for the long-term stability of a country to have respect for division of power, uh, for human rights, democratic institutions, and the rest. And I think that is a very important message to communicate through education and through civic, uh, organizations, et cetera. What will you say um, are some of the trigger points that show that a change is finally happening or is about to happen in both cases? Well, in, in the case of, of, of Venezuela, you, you, I mean, there was a, an important um, uh, demonstration that was done on May 20th, even though it was not a protest like last year, is that, uh, I mean, the majority of the people didn't go and, and vote on this fraud. I mean, the fraud of, la of the May 20 was that big that even the Electoral Council that is controlled by the regime said that six out of 10 Venezuelans didn't go to vote. So if, 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 they, if they are saying that, I mean, the real, um, the real thing is that mm -hmm. maybe seven or eight out of ten Venezuelans didn't go uh, uh, to vote. As I, have, as I have been saying, I mean there is uh, disagreements on the armed forces and also uh, the pressure from the from the international uh, um, community. And I mean, and it's a, it's a, it, those are the things that we need to to uh, uh, to, to work. And I, I, I just something I want to add. Um, I think the case of Venezuela right now is unique. Um, I don't like the comparisons when we say, well, Venezuela with the Castro regime or, the, or the Chile was able to, to, to build democracy after Pinochet. I mean, Venezuela is a unique case. It's a narco petro state run by armed forces. I mean, citizens in Venezuela are unprotected. Venezuelans are hostages. Last week, Maduro wanted to, uh, you know, send a message to the international community that he has changed his behavior, and he released political prisoners. When he released those political prisoners, they are not able to uh, travel abroad. They cannot tweet. They cannot do any press conference. Uh, um, they, they, they need to go to the tribunals uh, once a month. And when they were released, they were released in the same group as uh, gangsters that were in the jail with them. So I mean, uh, this is a th that's that's why it's so complicated sometimes for us as a Venezuelan to explain the situation that is right now. But it's a narco petro state run by soldiers that has the 20 percent of oil reserve in the world, that has the eighth highest gas reserve in in the world. So um, uh, the, the 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 country, I mean, it, it is um, it is estimated that 350 billion dollars were uh, robbed in. In, in Venezuela. Uh, I was in Mexico just three weeks ago, and there is a debate about the new city of uh, Mexico City Airport that could cost $7 billion, where 50 new city, Mexico City Airport were robbed in Venezuela, 50 of maybe the biggest or one of the biggest airports in the world. So uh, we need to work on the international community, on the protests, and the, and the, and the, on the, on the armed forces. Thank you. Humberto, what are the signs of change? Coming. Uh, one good sign is the degree to which the, the population, especially young people, have been able to mobilize themselves and stand up for their rights on the streets. And that has, that has been a unique phenomenon. We were complaining before that Nicaraguan young people were too apathetic. They were so aloof. 
uh, not interested in politics. They were just playing with their cell phones and they, their iPads all the time. But suddenly they came up and they shown themselves to be very awake. And they, uh, it is moving how much they are, uh, they are willing even to die and expose themselves uh, for bringing change to, uh, to the country. And as long as they keep their, uh, this uh, spirit, uh, this uh, the determination to fight, we, ha we have hope. Uh, we have been in this uh, ordeal for two, for two months, and there are no signs that they are getting depressed or tired. They are co keep coming to the streets. They are being killed. They keep coming to the streets. And it is amazing the degree of unity that you see. Rich, young, uh, and poor people are united. Uh, all, all the social classes, the business community, with the uh, uh, street merchants, the peasants, the students. Uh, they, collab they collaborate. A lot of families are uh, giving food to those students living in the barricades. So uh, uh, that is quite moving and hopeful. And uh, when, when a country uh, this, uh, takes up some values and decides to stand up for them, you have hope. A apathy is the, the, uh, one of the worst enemies of democracy and one of the biggest allies of dictators. And we were victims of that. We were too apathetic for too many years. That allowed Ortega to grow and, uh, and become so strong. If we had been on the street earlier, uh, the, the tragedy that we are facing now could, could perhaps could have been averted. Is there another question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, because uh, in the last few years, there was some hope that, you know, with massive demonstrations and the electoral solution, a sort of kind of a combination, we will get rid of these regimes. But, you know, the Maduro regime and the Ortega regime has demonstrated that it doesn't matter, that they will rob the elections and they are going to kill people on the streets. What is the, the these probably third elements that we need to, to see to get rid of them? In, in, in the case of, of Venezuela, um, as I said, is the uh, institutional behavior from the armed forces. Um, if they become institutional, especially the middle and low range uh, officers from the armed forces, and Maduro is done. I don't have any doubt about it. Or movement has been dismantled in 10 months. Um, uh, but there is a strong disagreement inside the, uh, the armed forces, what I can share with you uh, uh, today. Uh, there's no way right now in Venezuela that we could go to an elections. Free and, if we go to a free and fair elections, Maduro will, will, will lose by 80 to 20, no doubt about it. But uh, he, will not, he will not accept that. So uh, we need the institutional behavior from the, from the armed forces and then to have free and fair election and the civil, civilians go to power. Humberto? It's quite similar to what, Venezuela, what, what David is saying. The army will be key, and the support of the international community, the concern of the international community for what, co what, for what is going on in Nicaragua will also have a very important effect. So, and those are, where, uh, those are my two hopes, one in the army and one in the rea international reaction to what is going on. Ambassador, we're right on the scheduled uh, time to finish, so thank you very much. Yes, unfortunately, all, all good things have come to have to uh, terminate sometime. Dictators. And uh, uh, we thank you very much for having come and join us uh, this afternoon. I must say that this has been one of the best events that we have had in several months. I want to I want to say thanks to our speakers our speaker and moderator, <laughs> uh, Armando. And I think it would be good to close the, uh, the program with a round of applause to our panel.